Hey everyone, namaste. So today we're going to be doing a book summary for the book, Bite Right, How Successful Couples Turn Conflict into Connection. And this is by Julie Schwartz Gottman and John Gottman. And I find that as I'm reading through this book, it really applies to any kind of relationship, intimate relationship, family, friends, peers, colleagues, work, or even towards the self. And just a reminder that I am not a healthcare professional. So please seek and consult healthcare professionals as necessary for your wellness and for your health. And before I start, I'm just gonna center myself a little bit. This is like the fourth false start. Hopefully this is not a false start, but the fourth start for this video is just one of those days where you know i'm like universe i got it i'm just gonna take some time drink my tea do my biscuits and relax through the presentation mm. as always this is yorkshire tea um from the UK, available on Amazon. Just search Yorkshire Tea. Solid, very, um, I would say it just has that right flavor, it has the right blend of flavor between Assam and Darjeeling. It's not too Darjeeling because Darjeeling can get bitter sometimes if not brewed correctly, and it's not quite the psalm where it's just too yeasty. It, it's, it's got the best of both worlds. It's got the aroma of the Darjeeling with, without the bitterness. And then it's got that sort of, um, the aroma of the yeast, like you're eating cookies in the, for, when you're, when you're drinking the psalm so it's got it's got the best of both worlds and it's just perfect perfect with milk mm. uh, so satisfying and of course i have my digestives today um don't mind if i do i'm gonna go ahead and take a bite mm. I'm just gonna take my time because feel free to skip through this part. This is me, this is like me telling myself that self-care matters. I'm satisfying my inner child and saying, hey, I matter too. As I'm doing this presentation for myself, of course, and for the world, um, this is of course a reminder a very visceral reminder that, hey, I matter too, so. Oh, so good. Tea and biscuit. I don't blame uh, the English for making this their customs and their afternoon ritual because it's just so satisfying. It is absolutely satisfying. When um, the tea variety is paired correctly with the biscuit, with the right type of biscuit. I know I sound totally smug right now, but hey, it's my experience. So here we, there you go. Okay. So Back to the book summary, Bite Right. Um, I have to say when I first got, there's sort of a resistance to the book when I first got it because uh, I'm more of a conflict avoided person. So I'm like, huh, fight. I don't know if I want to read a book with the word fight in bold font right on the book cover. But as it turns out, it's just a very smart and intelligent book on how how to have satisfaction in any connection really 
it's really about that basic satisfaction. It's, as you'll see, it becomes less about the fight, but trying to get at what exactly will allow us to feel satisfied in a connection. And that is the ultimate. It's not about winning the fight. You know, when we first look at the book cover, um, Now I have the, oh, just remember, just a reminder, the book pages. So what you see here on the bottom, this is uh, the slide page, but there's going to be other pages listed below the slide pages. And those pages refer to the hard copy. Um, so, you know, when I first got the book, I think, the direct sense is that, oh, it's the central focus, the central theme is still about the fight, you know, because the first word you see on this book is fight. And then the second word you see is right. Like we're supposed to fight the correct way so that we win. And then we perhaps win the relationship, but it, it's a lot more subtle than that. And it's laid out so much more elegantly and more beautiful than what this old font was initially suggesting to me. So I would definitely recommend it. It is a popular book right now because this just came out um, earlier this year. This is current 2024. And there's a long wait list in my local library. And that's why I'm like, I got to do this presentation because this is like today is the last day that I get to borrow this book. I have to return this book today after this presentation because I think there are like 20 people waiting after me. So um, people are, are interested. So I just, um, it's, my pleasure and my privilege to be able to do this again for myself because this is how I can also integrate this information for myself and also if it benefits you I'm so happy that I'm able to do this for whoever that just that just need it so let's go all right so Table of contents first, it's organized in parts. So there's introduction and then part one, conflict 101 separated into three parts. And then part two, the five fights everybody has and they go through the five fights that almost everybody uh, get into. And then there's conclusion and then the quick guide and then so on and so forth. So in the sections, um, my section markers don't have chapters on them. So when I do the timestamps, it's just going to be by the title of the chapter. So instead of like chapter one, what we fight, it's just gonna be why we fight in in, in the timestamp. And I mean, it's, it's a straightforward forward enough table of contents. So um, it should be easy for you to find each section. And I'll probably separate part one from part two in terms of uh, the video because uh, it gets it gets pretty long. I think we're looking at about 30 slides for part one, also 30 slides for part two. But I have condensed them so that I am really giving you the essence. And I just wanna mention that for part two, I'm actually summarizing from the quick guide because they, the Gottmans go into each fight in detail and they also give you real life examples or the examples that they've seen in their, in, in their lab. And they go through a lot of exercises and just remember I just, in order to accommodate the summary, I've cut out a lot of exercises that they listed in the actual chapters. So just know that this is 
absolutely an abbreviated, abridged version of the book, but hopefully it really gets to the essence so you can start remembering and applying some of these concepts right away. Okay, so that's table of contents. So introduction, what are we fighting for? What a question, right? I ask that myself all the time, all the time too. So conflict is a human constant. We know that already. And there are two basic types of fight. One is solvable and one is perpetual. So according to the Gottman, 69% of our problems are perpetual. So issues that tap into differences in personalities, priorities, values, beliefs that don't really change that much over time and hard for us to let go. And 60% of those become gridlocked that cause hurt, anger, and distance. <clears throat> and out of 40,000 couples seeking therapy in Gottman's International Study, which was published in the Journal of Marital and Family Therapy um, in April, 2020, 60% experienced domestic violence, 27% experienced anxiety, 46% depression, 29% ideations, and one third was going through substance abuse and 35% was going through fallout from affair. So, I mean, it, this is just, we, we can, we sort of get it right. This is just human drama. So we're really, we're really not alone. I mean, we don't like to see these numbers, but um, it just, it's just so common. It is just so common, regardless of the Instagram um, facades that we post out, you know, at the privacy of our own homes, sometimes the sufferings are, are real and they're great. So conflict really just, it just happens. And the ultimate goal of conflict is to create something better for yourself for you and your partner as a couple and for the world. This is how the Gottmans define the purpose of conflicts. And we feel like we have to be on our best behavior and keep the complicated in a world hidden. And to the Gottmans that actually create problems down the road. Um, so we wanna see conflict as a profound opportunity to gain deeper understanding of our own conflict culture and where we got this culture from. And in book five, well, not, not book five, but the book will discuss five major ways that we go wrong when fighting with the other and how we can pivot to be on the right path so that the connection becomes reconnected, the connection becomes better. So part one, conflict 101, why we fight. So let's get to the nitty gritty of why. So coding conflict. The Gottmans use an AI system to code conflicts. So essentially, um, the Gottmans code the conflicts in order to study them and to get at the findings that, that they're presenting in this book. And they find that the AI has outperformed its human counterparts. So basically therapists. And I mean, it's really not hard to imagine right now that AI can outperform 
human counterparts in terms of picking up the uh, the subtle details, the muscle movements of a person's face and our and our gestures, they can pick up really, really subtle things. Where, whereas, you know, as humans, we're only sensitive to a certain level. So it's it's not hard to project that. And AI uses John's emotional coding system, SPATH, specific effect coding system. He looked for patterns and sequences of interactions, so like a chain reaction instead of just individual uh, um, not segregated, um, uh, independent interactions, but how they form a sequence that could be in that could be indicative of the couple's overall happiness and success in their relationship. So using SPAF to code a couple's interactions, John was able to predict with over 90% accuracy the future of the couple's relationship. So if you, a huge part of the prediction was based on how these couples behaved in conflict. And AI is extremely good at picking up paralinguistic cues down to a hundredth of a second. So the same sentence can be conveyed with different emphasis and can mean different things. And supposedly the AI accounts for cultural differences too. I don't know exactly how it works, but that's how the Gottmans described it in the book. Okay. So a textbook fight is about almost nothing. <laughs> One minute we're in a nice conversation, you know, we're having tea, we're eating biscuits, the next we're in a full-blown war. So it can move very quickly into difficult conflicts. It can escalate very, very quickly. I mean, we all, we've all been through that with, again, with anybody. If like you're not in an intimate relationship, project this information towards uh, family and friends, especially family, right? Just think of the holidays, family and friends, um, even towards the South or at work with the colleagues, with anyone you have work relationships with, you can, you can project that. And then, you know, there's no listening. There's no space for understanding, only attack and defend, attack and defend. And then it contains every single one of the horse, the four horsemen of the apocalypse, what the Gottmans identified as the four horsemen that we really don't want to see in a conflict, which are criticism, contempt, defensiveness, stonewalling. I mean, guilty much. We've all done it. I have done it. And I see my, I still see myself doing it. I mean, it's great that the Gottmans are providing the solve in the book. So it is practical in that way where we will get uh, the solutions to this. But right now we're just talking about what can easily come up in conflict. And then when these the four horsemen comes up, there's flooding. There's too much. Too much is being triggered. And then negative interactions rapidly outnumber the positive. And for couples to be successful, the positive to negative ratio in conflicts need to be at least five to one for the relationship to be sustainable. And... And then in terms of the textbook fight, next, there are very few, if any, repair attempts. And then finally, it's about the in-laws. You know, it somehow always lands with the in-laws. Of course, again, this book is organized around coupledom. If you're not in, you know, intimate relationship, again, again, just project to a connection that is challenging for you. 
opposites attract. We are doomed to fight. So opposites attract is the scientifically accurate phase. Based on, part of it is based on a t-shirt smell study that suggests we're likely to choose someone with genetic sequence that's most different from our own to increase our immune system. So if you don't know what the t-shirt smell study is, just Google it, it's out there. And then the more couples can be accepting of each other's differences, the better. And what goes wrong is that we try to turn the partner into ourselves and criticize them when it doesn't work. And that is just so common, even among family and friends and work colleagues. It's, we, through instinct, I have to say, we expect, naturally expect the other person to have the same set of values, to have the same set of baseline behavior as us. So when, when we see somebody else reacting to a certain circum event or circumstance, in a different way than we do, and it triggers something within us, it's so easy for us to go into conflict mode instead of remembering that we pair, perhaps pair well with this particular partner precisely because of our differences. And one of the biggest reasons that conflict escalate is that we have a tough time dealing with our partner's negative emotion. It doesn't feel good, especially when when we're close and in intimate situations or family and friend situations. We love them, you know, we we feel very emotionally close to them. So so when they're throwing negative emotions, it's additionally difficult for us to take. And we feel attacked, defensive, and we suppress negative emotions until they explode. I mean, they really, the Gottmans haven't described anything that's out of the ordinary yet. We've all gone through pretty much everything that I just described, I think. So pretty straightforward. Now, don't be afraid of anger and conflict. Now, this is quite eye-opening for me, actually. So John was actually wrong about two assumptions when he first started the Love Lab. Number one, that, that anger is a dangerous emotion. This one really shocked me. This one was really eye-opening for me to understand why anger is not a dangerous emotion. Because, you know, in, in meditation, in Buddhist practices, we're always talking about the dangers of anger, of fighting the, I still remember, Pema <laughs> children talking about being aware of not fighting the hook in terms of anger. And it was a video recording from Sounds True and it actually helped me a lot, but this is giving me a new perspective on anger. Okay, so number two, um, one of John's wrong assumptions is that a lot of fighting at the beginning of a relationship is a bad sign. This one, I was curious about. It didn't really shock me, but it's it's counterintuitive. It really is counterintuitive. So turns out when conflict was driven by the female partner, bring up issues early on in the marriage, the relationship turned out to be stronger and more successful than others. And they call this the, the wife negative effect. And it is good for the relationship because then the female partner would be laying out what they need right from the get-go. And for no conflict newlyweds, they look better initially, but many of the women were suppressing their needs instead of expressing them. And I would say that that extends to the dating uh, 
the dating arc, the story arc as well, where, you know, we're thinking of Disney, we're thinking of fairy tales, and we are acting out the fairy tale. And then when we get married, we want to hold on to that fairy tale as much as possible, but that is actually not good for the relationship. Because eventually we all have needs and we really need to negotiate and express them. And thank God, you know, this book came out, right? It's just research is finally there to give us some guidelines around what we can, what we can do um, to manage conflict, to really have better conflicts. So not all things that were coded negative in the AI system were negative in the long term. So anger being one of the examples. So I believe what the Gottmans mean is that anger was still coded as negative in the AI system that they used. But in the long run, anger was not an indicator for to the negative was not an indicator for something negative that's farther down the road. It may be negative in the present moment, but not so negative down the road. So I really found that interesting. And then for modern neuroscience, anger may be more aligned with positive emotions like joy and excitement. This is like, this is mind blowing to me, but this has been scientifically studied in neuroscience. So turns out there's more activity in the right frontal lobe when we experience sadness, fear, disgust, et cetera. And there's more activity in the left frontal lobe when we experience interest, curiosity, joy, and anger. You would, you know, you would expect anger to be connected to the right frontal lobe, which is more about sadness, fear, disgust, you know, the yuckies. And yet it's connected with the left, you know, which is about interest, curiosity, joy, the positive emotions that we experience. So that's why now researchers think of anger as an approach emotion. It doesn't exactly line up with either positive or negative. And we'll learn about what they mean by approach. Um, oh, it's coming up. So it means that anger is driving you to approach your partner. It's an indication to connect and engage, express something that needs to be expressed. However, the proviso again, as long as the four horsemen isn't involved, anger can be a positive thing. As long as the four horsemen isn't involved. And female anger has been more historically repressed Either way, there's no shame in feeling anger. So it's almost like the Gottmans are inviting us to use anger as a cue, as a mental cue to remember to connect, remember to engage. And we'll, we'll talk more about this um, in the following slides, especially for females, we have been taught that anger is not acceptable. Even we've been taught in a way where not only in terms of behavior, but it's been justified through um, health implications. You know, I just, I remember whenever I would say to my mom that, you know, hey, I'm really angry about something. She would always remind me that anger is not good for the body. And I have learned enough from psycho positive psychology and neuroscience that um, anger, if not expressed, is 
even worse to the body than than anger that is able to be expressed. It is about um, allowing the anger to remind us that there needs to be communication here, perhaps regarding needs, so on and so forth. So sort of um, anger has been labeled as such a negative emotion that most people, especially women, they want to shun it. They want to suppress it. But it turns out it's, it's not good to do that. And we have to use it. It's smart. It's better for the relationship for us to use anger as an indication for us to approach our partner and not to avoid. This is something that, you know, that takes practice because uh, it's against sort of the conservative traditional conditioning for sure. Okay, conflict is a royal road to understanding. So recognize conflict as an approach emotion and not think of it as bad. We just don't want to approach our partner with anger that manifests as contempt, criticism, defense, defensiveness, and stonewalling. Again, the four, the four horsemen that ruins everything. <laughs> and we want to approach each other with curiosity. I love this word, curiosity. I use it in many, many presentations. Whenever we get to healing, we get to, uh, we get to doing the shadow work where we're faced with the parts of ourselves that we oftentimes judge, that we fall into self-hate, self-blame. We have to approach it with a sense of curiosity and flip that externally when we're dealing with something that feels like it's the uglies outside now, it's best to deal it, to use curiosity to deal with it. So a relationship is a constant negotiation of individual versus the collective. Yeah, we wanna belong but we also want to be individuals. Like we want to be accepted as a part of the tribe. And yet we also want to be recognized for our own needs and wants. So the tension between trying to be true to who we are versus being true to the collective will always be there. That strain will always be there. So to address the tension, we look to the conflict culture of the relationship meaning the rules of fighting that you each operate within, which are often invisible and unacknowledged. So basically the conditioning behind how we approach conflicts are, as we can imagine, very much based on our, our upbringing. That's, that's a no-brainer, right? So why we fight the way we fight. There are three main conflict styles and the Gottman stress that these conflict styles fall within a healthy relationship. All three fall within healthy relationships. So first avoiding, so that means not have conflictual discussions at all. We just agree to disagree and we drop the conflict completely. Second type, validating. So we fight politely, collaboratively, and we're interested in reaching compromise. And third style, volatile. So you erupt into conflict. The conversations are more intense and dramatic. So for the conflict avoidant couple, they can have more defined and traditional roles. They can lead actually very stable lives, but can also end up lonely and isolated. 
Alternatively, they can be interested in each other's feelings and talk about them. They leave it at that without knowing how to accept influence from each other. And we'll talk about that later. Turns out accepting influence from each other is necessary for a successful relationship as well. And they can actually be the happiest of all the types because they know the roles, what they're supposed to do, and they don't touch the red zones. Avoiders in general might cruise along in calm waters and do just fine if nothing rocks their boat, if nothing rocks their boat. And then the validating couple aren't afraid to get into it and disagree. They'll debate and accept each other's influence. They're not content with agree to disagree or forget about it. They want, they want to get somewhere. Um, they want resolutions. It can get pretty tense, but they'll quickly bring it back down to a collaborative, logical approach and level. So validators will take breaks when things escalate. And a hallmark of validator is that they'll abandon their position in order to avoid big volatile emotions. So I wouldn't say that they they suppress their emotions, but they are keen to get to a compromise where big emotions are not triggered. And they will give something up rather than risk escalated quarrels. Usually they grew up with a volatile parent and now they want to avoid the dynamic at all costs. And that's why they discuss things, they prefer to discuss things calmly, logically, eloquently, maybe elegantly, because if they go into the volatile argument or if things escalate, it triggers them in terms of their um, family of origin environment too much. And that makes sense. And then for the volatile couple, they have no problem expressing their emotions. <laughs> Fights move immediately to high emotions and raise voices. We've seen so many TV moms and dads do that. Um, I don't have a show in my head right now, but you know, we've seen this played out in real life and also on TV so much. Um, with humor and positivity, the volatile couple can be successful. They understand how to make repairs and stay connected. That's with humor and positivity. Um, the risk is in the arms race where escalation ensue, can ensue based on perceptions of, poten of potential offense, leading to an exponential buildup of aggression. Now arms race, just remember back to the 80s, the, the nuclear arms race, where it's like both the US and Russia were anticipating each other to, um, to launch a nuclear attack. So what they did was they each started to pile up their nuclear weapons, um, in anticipation of an offense. So the same thing with the volatile couple where they, they, they start gathering firepower until um, something triggers and then the whole thing just blows up from the buildup of aggression. And so database conclusion, any of the three styles has an equal shot at a good relationship if they have the five to one ratio of positive to negative interactions and conflict. Turns out style doesn't matter. It's all about the ratio. I need to pause here a little bit because this is really, let's sink this in a little bit. If all just, let's really listen to what the Gottmans are saying. The conflict styles don't matter, don't really matter. What really matters is the ratio 
of the positive to negative interactions in any of these styles. It is all about the ratio and they'll keep mentioning the five to one throughout the book. It is, it is so defining. And remember that is just in the conflict. In a conflict situation, the ratio is already five to one. That is necessary to, to maintain satisfaction in the relationship. In conflict, it's already five to one. That means in real life, the ratio has to be higher and we'll mention that in another slide. So just process that a little bit. You can be any of the conflict styles. And they also mention that um, our conflict styles are not exclusive to just one style. It could be like 20% volatile and then 80% um, what is what was the other one? And 80% validating or you know 80% volatile and then maybe 10% validating, 10% avoidant. It could be a mix like that. Yeah. So I just have a little note there, side note. I see that we can extend this to relationship with self, colleagues, peers, et cetera, which I already mentioned. And it's like, I can be angry but need to be aware of for horsemen, criticism, contempt, defensive, defensiveness, and stonewalling, and the ratio. It has implications on um, like all conflicts in all arenas. I can be angry in any arena with a colleague, with a peer, with myself, but remember, if the ratio goes below five to one in terms of positive to negative interactions within the conflict, then the practice is we have to somehow raise it. We have to raise that ratio in order, again, in order for the interaction to be satisfying, in order for the connection, partnership to be satisfying. Okay, I'll take a tea break. All right. Again, the ratio is real. Within a conflict, the positive to negative ratio needs to be five to one to balance out negativity. I mean, it was just negativity bias is a neuroscience term that's been thrown around enough already. We all know about it. And of course, in relationships, you know, it's it's it applies five to one. And outside of conflict, the ratio goes to 20 to 1. For every negative interaction, you need 20 positive to balance out the negative. And the positives can be appreciation, connection, turning toward, compliments. Um, and these are some examples of positive interactions. So it could be apology, smile, nod. Um, empathizing, reassuring physical touch, if appropriate, joke, laughter, you know, these, it doesn't have to be big. They can actually be very fleeting. And micro gestures, but they really count. Validating something your partner said, emphasizing what you and your partner have in common, Owning your responsibility for your part in a problem, saying good point, fair enough, pointing out what you both do that is right, recalling your past successes in conflict. They can add up if we're conscious of it. One of the strategies for successful conflict is imbuing your fights with more positive interactions. So don't have to overtly count. You can feel which side of the ratio you're on and just course correct and slip in a 
a, a couple of compliments somewhere in there or just that attempt to connect in a softer way, in a softer way somewhere in there. And for avoidant couples, their ratios can look great initially because they're avoiding the negatives, but they're skirting around issues. They don't have tense or explosive fights. So um, emotional drifting can happen very, very quietly because they're just, again, avoiding the deep. So learning to be a bit more comfortable with conflict can help us learn more about each other so that we don't drift apart as easily. And validators can get focused on logistics and lose track of positivity instead of fixating on compromise. How you get there is a critical part of the process. So um, I do identify with a validator where I would use logic and I would want to reach a compromise uh, very harmoniously. And yet what the Gottmans are saying is that sometimes validators, they skip the true expressions of emotions and we skip to wanting to go to the compromise right away as in, okay, you'll do two and then you'll put in two and then she'll put in five and he'll put in three this time and next time we'll flip, we'll switch. Okay, done. But we actually want to talk about uh, the emotional pieces because they're actually really important. So how we got to the compromise is very, very important. It's actually critical. And our, I would argue, uh, based on what I understand from the Gottmans, it is more important. <laughs> the how is more important than what compromise you actually settle with. And then for the volatile couples, they need a lot of positivity to keep the skills tipped in the right direction. And that's to be expected. Okay, conflict styles that are never successful. So remember the three conflict styles that, that we're talking about are actually healthy and can be successful as long as the ratios are above five to one. And um, that's the ratios of positive to negative. And then conflict cells that are never successful that require a lot of intervention are hostile and hostile detached. So hostile is going into conflicts with all the four horsemen with zero positive interactions. And hostile detached is they don't even bother arguing. They're just at a point of not caring anymore. They've lost even conflict as a bridge to connection. And what gets trickier are that couples with meta emotion mismatch. So meta emotion being how we feel about feelings, which means different beliefs about emotions should be expressed or handled. So there's a mismatch between couples around how they process feelings and how uh, they feel about those feelings. So for example, to a volatile person, an avoider would seem too detached and too uncaring because avoiders need that space. But uh, to the volatile, they need to spit the emotions out. They need to have the face-to-face -face interaction right away. So comparatively to a volatile, the avoider will seem detached and uncaring. And to an avoider, a volatile person could overwhelm them and make them disengage even more. And there's no right or wrong here. And so out of the difficult couplings, avoidant validator, validator, volatile, 
and volatile avoidant. The volatile avoidant mismatch is the toughest because they're on the ex extremes of the scale. So it's going to be tough if your partner says volatile when you're avoidant or vice versa because you process emotions in very, very different ways. And people in conflict almost never had a, malevol a malevolent intent. That is also not difficult to imagine. Like we all come into relationships, we come into fights with the best of our intentions for the relationship. And we're all just trying to be understood. So uh, what's happening here is that the intention does not match the impact, the, the good intentions that we bring, that we oftentimes, most of the times bring into the fight really does not match up with the impact that we're actually making in the fights. And so let's talk about the stages of the fight. Every fight has the same basic structure. Let me do a little tea and biscuit. I hope this is interesting so far. I mean, I was so engrossed by what the Gottmans are saying. It's, it's fascinating. Like, I feel like we should be learning this in elementary school. It is so fascinating and important. Hmm. Feel free to fast forward while I take a little biscuit break. So yeah, every fight has the same basic structure. You build an agenda and then you persuade and then you wanna reach a compromise. And where the styles differ really is in the persuasion. So avoiders want to skip the, persua the persuasion. The volatile wants to start with persuasion and skim over the partner's point of view. And validators go into persuasion too soon and doesn't go deep enough to explore the emotions around the issues. Like I said, with validators, um, they skim through the feelings and they want to go right to the compromise. And then volatiles, um, they just want to persuade without even listening to their partner's point of view. And we all have backstories of how we develop our conflict styles. For example, in the book, they, uh, they gave the example of Noah and Tyler, a gay couple. So Noah's volatile conflict style came um, experiencing conflict what am I trying to say here? Noah's volatile conflict style um, I don't know what I was trying to say. Basically, um, uh, Noah's volatile conflict style was a result of um, his family of origin and Tyler's avoidance style came from bad conflict escalations from his parents that resulted in his mother leaving the house for days once. Um, right, so going back to Noah's volatile conflict style, it was about experiencing conflict as normal and even a form of connection in his family of origin as he was growing up. So Noah's family used conflict as a way to connect, whereas Tyler um, experienced 
bad conflict escalations of his parents during his childhood, which led to his mother leaving the house for days this one time. And so he has become avoidant of um, not emotions, but avoidant of conflict and conflict escalation. So the good news, you can learn to change stretch conflict styles to meet your partner where they are. So first build your awareness, discuss with your partner, what was my formative conflict culture? You know, think back to your upbringing, family of origin, what were your parents' conflict styles like? You know, according to, um, it didn't start with you, <laughs> the book by Mark Wallen. Chances are we're all influenced by our family system and how our family systems dealt with conflicts, dealt with uh, emotional information. So look back to your family, your family system to see how you developed this conflict style? And what did I learn about uh, conflict from my family of origin? What beliefs about conflicts do I carry? And then what's my personal conflict style and meta emotion mode? Are some feelings easier for me to express than others? Like, how do I feel about feelings? And how do I express feelings? And how do our conflict styles interact? Do we have the same styles, you know, in a relationship and a connection? How does this affect our conflict discussions? So this is more of a reflective exercise to think back, to see patterns in our history on how we typically handle conflicts. Okay, so now what are we fighting about? What is it about really? From ecstasy to eggshells, what are we really fighting about? So the number one thing that couples fight about, drum roll please, of course, it's about nothing. Meaning anything can spur conflict. It's usually about nothing at all. So more deeply, we're often fighting about values. What is love? What is home? What does it mean to be a family? And we're fighting about unrecognized needs. And there's so many, but some big ones are the needs for play, connection, romance. And 80% of couples starting therapy say that there's no romance anymore. That's not hard to imagine, right? And then hidden dreams. What are my hopes and dreams, both now and for the future? What is my life purpose, my reason for being here? I understand these are very first world questions. I'm very self-aware on that. But if you are interested in this book, that means you're in the position to really uh, uh reflect on your relationships in a deeper way. And as I always say, you know, your inner peace actually contributes to my inner peace and contributes to world peace. So affect world peace in that way, starting with your own inner peace and your peace around your relationships. So a big part of satisfying long-term love is developing the capacity to realize when what we're fighting about is not about the cold pizza on the counter that, you know, that my partner forgot to put away, put it back in, in the warming oven, but a longing for efforts to be appreciated. So, um, I forgot what I was gonna say with the plant. And so it's not, what was that example? Oh, um, it's not about planting a new plant um, or 
I think the example was that the partner of this person wanted to have new plants in the house. So the issue may not have been for wanting new plants, but the pressure of new commitment and not having had the space to talk about it at all. And it, it's not about the price of a bottle of the wine, but a deeper fear of parental rejection. This example came from a couple who were trying to select a wine and visiting their in-law or that person's in-law. And um, the partner really wanted an expensive wine because they have a fear of parental rejection. And then the couple got into a fight. So something like that. So basically, they're all they're always underlying issues that has to do with values, unrecognized needs, and hidden dreams. It's not really not really about the content. It is, but then it isn't. So bids for connection, a key piece of the conflict puzzle. So a bid for connection is anything you do or your partner does to try to get the other person's attention and, and connect with them. They don't need to be big or deep chats, can be just small asides. And these and minor interactions matter a lot and they absolutely count as a positive interaction. So there are three positive ways that partners can respond to a bid for connection. So you could turn toward, so responding positively to your partner's bid. You could turn away, ignoring your partner's bid, maybe not wanting to open a can of worms and you know, in my own projection, my own experience, a lot of us turn away, not because we want to, but because we are like exhausted and tired at the end of the day, or that we're just so distracted with our own mental dramas and issues that happen at work or issue that happened on the road, like bad traffic, whatever, whatever it is, or, you know, my stocks fell you know, a whole point today and I'm stressed. It's because of those mental stresses that we we ignore the bids, um, not out of malice, but just out of our own inner distractions. And then you can also turn against the bid, responding negatively or harshly to the bid. So bids for connection, um, Ordinary fleeting moments are one of the biggest predictors of the future health of relationship. So happy couples turn toward their partners a lot, 86% of the time, 86. And happy couples don't. They turn toward their partners 33% of the time, um, about one third of the time so you that means you gotta you gotta have three tries for one of them to have your couple turn towards you for unhappy for an unhappy couple so just let that sink in for a little bit um turning toward become the money and the goodwill in the emotions bank account and it needs to be full enough to be drawn for later friction. Any fight can be nasty when the emotion bank account is drained. When there's nothing in the bank, you, there's nothing to draw from. So that's why the ratio is really, number one, the ratio is important um, of positive negative interactions and the turning toward responding positively to a partner's bid is really important. Again, happy couples turn toward their partners 86% of the time, 86%. So if conflict has been an issue, consider the following. Um, 
how have your recent bids for connection been received? How have you responded to bids for connection? Has there been patterns of turning away, turning against? So how full is your emotional bank account? How do you feel about the following? Do you look forward to spending time with your partner? Is there a lot of shared humor between us when we spend time together? Do we have fun? So do we have a sense of what's going on with our partner this week and what they're stressed about or they're feeling proud of their successes? And when you look at your partner, do you feel grateful for their presence and for what they contribute to the relationship and the home? Do we wake up in the morning with a sense of weeness, even if the partner, uh, even if you and your partner had a busy day? Uh, do you feel supported? Are you able to feel that they have your back and then you don't have to wake up feeling alone? So reflect on that. And there's no self-blame if you said not really to any of the above, um, the chances for partners to line up in physical and emotional availability for each bid for connection is pretty low as you can imagine, because we all lead very busy lives, right? And so leaving this to chance without the intention to turn toward decreases those odds even more. So I think what the Gottmans are saying is that don't don't leave this to chance. Um, if you want to be in um, a happy relationship, so first mission is to turn toward. And our lives won't make this easy. A dual income couple with kids on average spend only thirty five minutes one on one time with each other per week. That is per week, not per day. It is per week. And this is according to a UCLA Sloan Center study. Um, actually, it makes sense when we really think about it. That means it's like five minutes per day that they're spending one-on-one -on -one time with each other. Probably just the five minutes before bed, right? Um, so the fleeting opportunities for connection that are sprinkled throughout the day have an enormous power to affect the future of our relationship because they build trust. So in any conflict we ask, we're essentially asking in any conflict, can I actually trust you? Can I trust you that you have my best interests at heart? Can I trust you to be kind to me right now? Can I trust you to treat me with respect during this conversation? Can I trust you to be a team with me even though we're disagreeing? Of course, it's, it's mutual. You know, we're doing this and we're recognizing that our partners are, are doing this. We don't wanna be just one-sided where we're like, gimme, 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 gimme. You know, we don't wanna be narcissistic. It's, it's a two-way street, right? We're asking these questions and we also recognize that our partners will be asking these questions in conflict. All right, so again, there are two types of fights, solvable and perpetual. So solvable, solvable fights have solutions, meaning once they're fixed, they're not likely to come up again. And chances are, you know, these fights don't really trigger anything that has to do with values or our dreams. Um, and perpetual problems, which account for 69% of our fights, aren't going anywhere and will never be resolved. And we'll have to live with, live with and manage for the rest of the partnership. Perpetual problems account for 69% of conflicts. Just remember that. And common denominator in fights that go wrong. All fights that go wrong typically have one thing in common, dismissing our partner's negative emotions, which just instinctively we all do. Um, and here, here's the process of escalation. 
So first negative emotion ex is expressed. Like maybe I'm really upset that you forgot my birthday. And then the partner may respond by minimizing or dismissing. They can be like, it's no big deal. I mean, we celebrated, you know, a couple of days after. You're too sensitive. And then the emotion intensifies, right? I'm pissed. And then, and then flooding of emotions, flooding of what gets triggered, and then the four horsemen enter, or then throwing around defensiveness, criticism, contempt, and stonewalling. And then there's the escalation of the fight. And then damage is done. I mean, the formula is pretty straightforward. And then things get gridlocked. What is it? How do we get? How do we get out? So in gridlock, we become completely shut down to each other. There's no listening. There's no opening up. There's no collaborating, understanding, and we end up vilifying in our minds. Like you're just, you're just selfish. You're just stubborn. There's no getting around you and we'll never figure this out. It's like, you're wrong, you're wrong, you're wrong. And then there's no way to change this and we won't figure this out. And almost a gridlock conflict is actually about unfulfilled dreams. So in the book, the Gottmans give an example, Matt and Amy. So they're an Asian American couple living near San Francisco and they're in gridlock over moving to Seattle for asking job opportunity that comes with a 30% raise. And for Amy, she's like, is it worth it to be plucked out of the current routine, take the kids out of their schools, spend so much money moving, you know, is 30% really gonna cover it? We have to start new with everything. And then Matt's like, the only way to get out of debt, I think in the example, they both have student loan debts, is to make money. This is not advanced algebra. Like, we need more money to cover our debts. And both are hashing it out like it's a financial issue. They approach it from a financial angle. And um, for Amy, there's that added layer of feeling terrified about losing the community and connections. Well, actually, behind the financial language of, you know, is it really worth it, financially worth it to move so far away and start anew? For her, it's about feeling terrified about losing the community and connections they built. And she was able, she was finally able to enjoy the connections as the kids are getting older. And for Matt, it's about being passed over for promotions at his current work and finally finding a company that appreciates and values him. So it's really about the values for the both of them. On the surface, they're using uh, finance as ammunition as leverage, but beneath that, it really touches on their values and their dreams. What are their dreams? So basically what the Gottmans are saying is that when in gridlock, move quickly to dreams that are underneath the conflict. Don't stay on um, the conflict level or the token level. So um, when gridlock means the end of the road. So not all gridlocks are the same. So deer breaker, not deer breaker, deal breaker, sorry. Number one is abuse. So there are two types of domestic violence, situational and characterological. So situational domestic violence result in escalation and is confined to specific incidents. And it can be overcome with training and support. And characterological domestic violence has two types of perpetrators, pit bulls and cobras. Um, so 
so pit bulls are jealous. Um, and they isolate partner from friends and family. And cobras are erratic, explosive, and strikes out of nowhere. And victims are female 85% of the time. And they never truly take responsibility for the violence and they blame it on victims for causing their behavior. There's no effective treatment for characterological domestic violence. So in, in this case, um, there's no other way around, which the Gottmans seem to be pointing that you just, sometimes you, you, you let go. And then I keep saying, sorry, it's deal breaker. So deal breaker number two, uh, refusal to seek help for addiction. So recovery is possible, but they have to seek help. Addiction itself is not a deal breaker, but a refusal to address it may be. And so um, we don't want to fall into a codependent situation when the person who um, has an addiction is not able to actively ask for help and we tried helping them and still doesn't, it doesn't work. Um, again, we have to just remove ourselves from the situation. And then deal breaker number three, differences surrounding having children. I think this is a no brainer for most of us. So if this is a cause of friction, then the dreams within conflict discussion will help you get clearer on whether there is a way forward or if your needs or values are just too different. Um, again, this is very uh, straightforward and intuitive. And now the top 10 myths about conflict. Some of these really surprised me. So myth number one, once we find a solution to a big fight, we'll be set, no more fighting. And it turns out most conflicts are perpetual. We need to learn to approach conflicts differently at a fundamental level, not how to solve one particular fight. It's not about solving individual fights, but the how we're doing the fights. Myth number two, if conflict is, exists in our relationship, we're not supposed to be together. This is a really interesting one to me. So conflict is actually unavoidable, even for the happiest of couples. We're bombarded with fairy tales that end with happily ever after instead of, you know, happily ever after. And then we start fighting over whose turn it was to take out the garbage. But that's how it actually happens in real life. And then myth number three, a conflict is a problem to be solved. This one I would say is really important. So conflict is unavoidable. Um, wait. Sorry, I uh, copy pasted the content, but basically a conflict is not a, conf um, a problem to be solved because it is usually perpetual, as we talked about before. 69% of the conflicts cannot be solved. So it's not about solving the problems. It's about being able to go through discussions with more positivity than negativity, meaning that the, uh, the goal is to have a positive interaction. It's not about solving the conflict. And then myth number four, one of us is right and one of us is wrong. So actually both partners' experiences, especially experiences and views are valid. Both realities are true. So what matters is how we see things, feel what we need, and if we can hear and validate each other, this is always more important 
than simply who is right. Again, it's about having a positive interaction. It's about being able to uh, validate each other's experiences than trying to decide who is right. That's when we hear it, it makes sense, but we forget this so much, especially when we're in conflict. Myth number five, men are more logical than women. Women are more emotional than men. So logic and emotions do not have genders. And this is according to international study. I don't know which one, I think it's in the bibliography uh, section of the book. Men have emotions and need to express them, and women need to be listened to and believed when they describe their reality. So stereotyping is damaging, limiting, and absolutely untrue. And myth number six, the best conflict management is logical, rational, and unemotional. <laughs> this is actually what I used to believe. But new psychological research show that emotions and logical thinking are intertwined when it comes to problem solving. So we can't, basically it means we can't problem solve well and effectively without information from, um, from one's emotions, from our emotions and our partner's emotions. So best conflict management allows us to understand each other better through listening to each other's feelings and ideas. Feelings and ideas really matter and we wanna feel validated by our partners in terms of what we're feeling and what our views are. And of course, it's a two-way street. While our partners validate us, we also have to learn to listen, really be a good listener, and validate their reality, regardless of how we see things. You know, unless they're one of the deal breakers, just remember, unless they're one of the deal breakers, for most people, it works like this. So myth number seven, negative emotions are bad and should be avoided. So as we talked about, turns out there's nothing wrong with anger. What matters is how anger is expressed. We should never express anger by aiming contempt or criticism at our partner, but it is okay to express our anger in terms of how we feel and what we see. So the languaging there, I think, takes a little practice. So in terms of pointing fingers when we're angry, what we're, uh, I think what the Gottmans is saying is that we are now more describing our internal landscape, our emotional landscape, so that the partner understands how we see things and how we experience things. Myth number eight, nobody can hurt you unless you let them. So we can and do hurt each other. Um, remember in one of the previous slides, uh, the Gottmans mentioned that intention can look very different from impact. Uh, so we can and do hurt each other, even though we have the best of the intentions. So no matter how great the relationship um, we do hurt each other and master couples process what happened and repair. They make attempts for repair and we'll learn how. So new age philosophy, sometimes new age philosophy advocates belief, the belief that you can choose how you feel. Um, I do love, uh, law of attraction teachers like Abraham Hicks. So, so you know, there, there are subtleties to what Gottman is pointing at versus what someone like Abraham is pointing at. So just look to what the Gottmans are pointing at here. It actually doesn't negate the law of attraction. But um, when they're saying that you can choose how you feel, 
I believe that the Gottmans are saying that we can simply um, push away anger. Or people believe that you can actually just just push away the anger and not recognize it as long as we don't recognize anger. It doesn't have to be there. But emotions are hardwired into our brains and are instinctive. And I think the key word is instinctive. We can instead choose to heal. Like if we get triggered out of because of our survival instinct, you know, we get triggered. There's no um, real wisdom in blaming ourselves for it or suppressing it. Um, but there is wisdom in choosing um, the next possible emotion. Um, it is wise to choose to want to express it properly so that we could move um, in a positive cycle so we can move towards healing. So myth number nine, you have to love yourself before you can love somebody else. That's thrown around a lot. And I have to say, again, instinctively, I don't think that's wrong, but um, the Gottmans also have a point. So basically they're saying we all have triggers, traumas, wounds that may never fully heal. And vulnerabilities may lead us to not perfectly love ourselves. We can still have a lifelong relationship. Our work is like partners is to care for each other, even in conflict, and to love our partners even when they can't love them, themselves. So it's almost like using each other as mirrors to be able to learn how to love ourselves better and better and better and not be shooting for perfection. So I don't have to be completely perfect for me to be in a positive, reflective relationship with the other and make the connection um, a positive one, you know, as we both work on ourselves. So I think that's that's what the Gottmans are saying. And then myth number 10, to be allowed to have needs, we have to justify or explain them. Um, we're built to have needs. As our needs bind us together and help us thrive together as pack animals, and our responsibility is to communicate them. One of the biggest reasons conflicts escalate is that we don't ask for what we need. Instead, we expect our partners to read our minds and magically fulfill our needs. Now, this is common enough where we just assume that, you know, after 20 years with our partners or after 20 years with a family member, they should, they should totally get that, you know, I hate eggplants already, or I hate, I hate peas, something like that, but they're not getting it because I haven't said it. I mean, it could be as small as that or as big as, hey, if you see me not talking to you for two days, that means something's up. You should know to approach me something as big as that um for some reason we think our partner should know and it does take that sort of uh, a divine moment to tap us on the shoulder and, and and for us to remember oh my god you know my partner is not psychic they they actually need words and sentences and modes of communication or you know sign language whatever, some sort of indication, aside from telepathy, <laughs> to be able to understand my own needs. I mean, sure, in our Aquarian age, telepathy is potentially possible in the near future through technological advances. I get it, but we don't quite operate on that level quite yet. So we do need to practice expressing ourselves. Okay, so I think this is the end of part one. It pretty much is just breaking down what the fight is, why we fight, and usually how we go about the fighting. And um, now that we understand what fights 
are and what actually needs to happen. You know, remember the five to one. So for part two, we're actually going to go towards, uh, let me just go back to the first slide, table of contents. We're going to go to um, the, the five, uh, the five ways that we can do the fights wrong and then how we can course correct to make, uh, to orient the fights so that they become a positive experience, a rewarding experience for the relationship for both sides of the party. So um, we'll get to that in the next video. Um, let's see. Yeah, I know this is this is a lot to process and it's like, oh my God, there's so much to learn and there's so little time. But again, with any type of healing work, just remember self-compassion is number one. We're not trying to get to a perfect state Remember that word curiosity. We're just here to be curious. We're here to practice. We're not trying to get to a perfected state. We're just going to have fun as we practice and be curious about what, what else can we become in this relationship? How can we evolve in this relationship? And not shoot for... Um, not expect, again, perfection and not shoot for unrealistic results as in I want to go from, let's say I give our relationship 20 out of 100 in terms of satisfaction right now. And we want to just, just uh, uh, fast forward through this, rush through this, and then get from 20 to 100% satisfaction within a week. Don't do that to yourself. Just be open to this information in the spirit of curiosity, in the spirit of exploration, and then just observe how you can use this information in your day-to-day -day life. So I'm going to go ahead and close here, and I'll see you in part two. Thank you. Namaste.